Okay, welcome back to another lesson. Today we will be looking at conflict and consensus theories. I have purposely missed out um, your AO1, AO2 and AO3 links on each PowerPoint, mainly because I want to see how and where you would um, place them, okay? So just to remind you really quickly, your AO1 is knowledge and understanding. Okay, so these are your basic concepts, your theories, okay, um, and your sociologists. Now, your AO2 is your application. This is where you put your studies into um, into context, okay, um, and your AO3 is evaluation and analysis. These I want you to be putting in your uh, in your slides or on sorry on your piece of paper or on each um, margin where you would usually write classwork or homework that's where I want you to write AO1, AO2 and AO3 for you to tell me actually miss this is where I think I'll be getting these marks and this is where I think I'll be getting those marks now your, your AO3s are usually the easiest ones to pick out because that is where you you are able to compare or analyze data for example you know that's what you're doing um, sometimes your AO1 and AO2 might be a little bit confusing for you because you have just started the course so I don't expect you all to get it straight away so just practice for me okay so sociological theory today we'll be looking at functionalism marxism some weber, uh, weber um, and the feminist perspective okay remember anything in or written in orange or in an orange box or has an orange highlighter this means i'm giving you a clue or i want you to expand on a thought or belief okay so uh, your green icon uh, sorry your green pencil uh, indicates that you need to self-assess and we've got quite a lot of self-assess in this lesson so be prepared don't forget your fail and sail little bolts there okay so for your uh, fail and sail I want you to have a look at this illustra uh, illustration okay what is it telling us about social inequality so we've got two lifts, one for the wealthy, one for the rest of us. The one that's for the rest of us is broken, okay? And it's been busted since the uh, since the 1970s, as um, this man is saying, okay? Um, I want you to analyse it, and I want you to tell me what you what you think is going on, okay? You you have your key terms at the bottom that you can use to help you. Uh, use as many as you can. I'll give you a point for each one that you've used and every single person should be attempting the Challenge make sure you write challenge for me on your piece of paper as well So I know you are constantly pushing yourselves for those top grades. Okay, so for your challenge Can you explain the illustration from a Marxist perspective using the key terms? Okay, so I want you to tell me if um, For example the bourgeoisie have always had it easy for example, okay? So, um, pause this video for me and continue to play when you are ready. Conflict theories, we have Marxism and feminism. The two big differences in, in Marxism and feminism as conflict theories is that Marxists feel as though society and the conflict within society is due to the class struggle and feminists... Uh, believe that the the struggle between um, uh, the genders are the biggest indicators of uh, conflict within our society okay so conflict theories argue that in most societies there are social inequalities between different social groups it is different to achieve a difficult to achieve consensus as the dominant or powerful groups go against the interests of the subordinate groups Conflict theories use the term ideology to describe how powerful groups put across ideas which justify their own position and help to make the existing social system appear to be fair. So, really quickly write down who do you think this is. Fantastic if you said Karl Marx, give yourselves a green tick for me please. 
Uh, capitalist societies are based on class divisions, says Karl Marx, um, and it's between those that benefit from the economic system and those that do not. This is an unequal and exploitative system. The working class would become aware of their exploited, pos exploited position and overthrow capitalism and create a communist society. I want you to really focus on bullet point number three here. This is an unequal and exploitative system. I want you to write down... Who is, uh, who is being exploited in this system and do you know how? Can you pause this video for me and tell me please? Now using the Google Classroom uh, handouts I've put up there for you, okay, um, I want you to tell me the role of ideology. So we've got two Marxist uh, theorists here on the side. Um, and I want you to produce a storyboard of the Marxist explanation. So include the following key terms. The capitalist system, ideological state apparatus, um, class inequalities, false consciousness and structures. Now, Althusser here came up with ideological state apparatus. And I want you to really understand what he means by ideological state apparatus. What goes on? What's in our day-to-day -day lives that make us... Uh, who we are and uh, stay in the position that we are if we aren't happy, if there is a con uh, conflict within society. So Marxism is a narrative, a grand story. I'll give you 15 minutes for that. So make sure you are using Google, um, uh, not Google, uh, GCSE Bite Size Sociology, for example. Um, that's really helpful. And all of the handouts I've put up on Google Classroom for you. So pause this video for me, please. So the structure of society according to Marxism. What I really want you to understand with this slide is that within our society, Marxists see there to be a, a hierarchy, but a very unfair, unequal hierarchy, which only serves these people here in the superstructure. Okay. Now the superstructure uh, filters down their ideologies through institutions like the family, media, religion, and politics to the economic base, okay? So the infrastructure. And the economic base and the inf infrastructure are our workers, okay? So they are our, our manual workers, for example, all, um, all those workers in retail, for example, everyday people like you and I, okay? This is a little bit more helpful, okay? So if you look at the ideological state, uh, uh, ideological superstructure at the top, it is all of the big institutions within our society. Now, we are aware of all of these institutions, but what we don't uh, particularly look at is exactly how they infiltrate or filter through to us everything that they want us to believe and everything they want us to, to behave like, okay? So the ideological superstructure maintains the economic base and the economic base is full of the pro proletariat, okay? So your uh, our, uh, Marxists will, will talk about two different types of people. They'll talk about the proletariat, who are the working class, and the bourgeoisie, who are the ruling class. And the bourgeoisie own the means of production Okay, and where their, their profit is made, they then give the proletariat just about enough to get by. Okay, and that's all it is. I want you to remember that Marxists believe that all, all the proletariat are doing are just, they can breathe just above water. They can keep their heads up above just water, uh, just about above water. Um, so they're not too uncomfortable to revolt. Okay. So again, using the handouts on Google Classroom to help you with this, I want you to evaluate how can we criti criticize the Marxist explanation, okay? What are its strengths and what are its weaknesses? I want you to sort the evaluation points into strengths and weaknesses and um, just stick them into your books, okay? Uh, like, as in write it down into your books. Then I want you to challenge yourselves. Can you think of any more that I haven't given you that you have either researched on or can think off the top of your heads? Make sure you, again, label that as your challenge so I know you are constantly pushing yourselves, okay? 
So when it comes to other conflict theories, uh, theories we look at Weberian theories, okay? Now, this is Max Weber. He disagreed with the way Marx analysed inequality. So he agreed that, yes, there are inequalities, but actually the way Marx looks at uh, inequalities wasn't to his liking, okay? He argued that differences of status and power were important and were not always linked to economic or class inequalities. Now, what I want you to remember when it comes to Weber and when it comes to Marx is the way they research um, anything within society is different. Marx looks at society from a very macro level. So he would look at how society shapes the individual, whereas your, your Weberian studies will look at how the individual and, and those small communities have an effect on society and how, how it changes society. And we see this in um, the Pro Protestant ethic and the spirit of cap capitalism, how a small group or how a small culture um has has created a big difference um in the rest of society okay so please keep that in mind now because we are looking at weberian um conflict theory right now it is so perfect with the with the goings on with what's going on in the world um we can use that as an example for the groups within society that may that may have less power and status compared to other groups so who right now within our society who do we overtly know that does not have uh, power or has a lot less power and status compared to other groups and can you tell me why can you can you possibly uh, make me understand why it is that we are we are treating other people differently within our society okay and pause this video for me until you are finished so the opposite of conflict theories is consensus theories your consensus theories emphasize the idea that human societies work best when their members agree on fundamental principles of how society should be organised and share common norms, values and beliefs. So this makes social life more predictable. Now, this uh, over here in the picture is Emil Durkheim. He is a functionalist. He's a founding father of functionalism. And he does talk about a lot about how society works so well together because of social cohesion and the reason why we are socially cohesive is because we all have the same fundamental rights and rules and norms and values for example and if we didn't have that then we would be in co uh, conflict with each other and only small parts of society there's only pockets of um, people who don't agree with each other and therefore there's uh, some sort of enemy or people commit crimes but then we have things put in place like laws to stop people from committing more crimes or the same crime okay um your consensus theories like Demil, uh, Emil Durkheim for example argues that members of society need to feel a sense of social solidarity and you feel the social so so solidarity from social cohesion Okay, Durkheim argued that in large modern societies, people would lose their sense of belonging and become anonymous individuals uncertain about how they behave or what their roles are in society. So, for example, when it comes to functionalism and if we were to look at uh, school, for example, because school is a microcosm of society, the way school is run... And what we have in school and the different groups of people we have in school and the systems that are put in place in school is exactly how a country is run, pretty much. Okay, so when we look at um, debate club, for example, so I run the debate club and we have a certain type of people that come to debate club, people who want to express themselves, people who want to, you know, have a say about certain things and do have opinions about certain things and, and push themselves um you know, instead of at lunchtime, maybe, you know, not sitting around in the canteen or the playground, um, they'll come to a debate club. Some will go to chess club. Some will go and play football, for example, because that's what they're fantastic at, okay? Um, so you have different clubs in school because that's what you're interested in. Now, all those little clubs and all those, so for example, you have, you know, the footballers who have their own culture and, and their own, you know, the things that they do outside of school also has a lot to do with their friendship groups within within school. Um, they are all subcultures, 
So the school as a whole, we have a, a culture, but then the subcultures within school um, have to they they have to agree and still abide by the laws or abide by the rules that the school has set. Okay, so the things we do in school, the things your teachers put in place for all of the different uh, groups and subcultures within school, it, to, it we we do all of those things, and the the underlying factor is what we want to teach you. Okay, so the underlying things we want to teach you, like tolerance, for example, like British values and and community, the sense of having a sense of community, and all of those things, we. Um, we do all of those things to to also um, ha uh, be able to to have social solidarity within school, so that we don't have too many people m misbehaving, and we don't have too many children, you know, bunking or or being defiant, so that we still keep you in place. Okay, um, please remember that because if you don't do that then you'll be in a state of anime, okay? So anime is a sense of moral confusion that weakens their commitment to shared values. The things, even the things you learn in school have a lot to do with, have a lot to do with um, how you will behave outside of school, after school, at the workplace, okay? At, at home, for example. Because even things that you learn from home, you, it is still reinforced in school. So things that you learn in your primary socialization, you bring to school. And if you didn't learn it in your primary socialization, your teachers will teach you that. Okay. So if you if you didn't learn basic manners in primary school, uh, in your primary socialization, you will learn it in your secondary socialization because your teachers will teach you. Okay. Other children will teach you. They say, "Oh, where's your manners?" Okay. So, again, when we look at society, okay, this is similar to what we saw when it, uh, with um, social, superstructure and infrastructure, okay, but it's a little different, and the reason why it's a little different is because we're looking at the individual and the society, okay, and how within society, everything that the superstructure want us to learn is filtered through all of these institutions to the individual, okay? And then this individual then filters it to their individuals, which will be their children, for example, okay? A really good example when it comes to this is if, let's say, you got bullied at school, okay? If you were getting bullied, your one of your family members might say to you, you know what, hit them back. If you hit them back, then they'll experience a taste of their own medicine, but every other institution within society tells you not to do that. Tells you not to fight fire with fire. Tells you that, for example, when it comes to law and when it comes to the police, you are going to be reprimanded. You, there are going to be consequences for your actions. Edu we see this through our education. So in school, if you were to have a fight, you'd get in trouble. You might get excluded for a couple of days. But what that's what school's teaching you. And remember, school has loads of values from religion. Okay. What school's teaching you will then it, is that you're going to have consequences. So when you are older, older, law and the police are going to get involved and you'll have a harsher punishment. Whereas actually, all these three things are telling four things are telling you, four institutions institutions are telling you one thing, and your family might be telling you another thing. Okay, and this is where, again, this is where anime comes in. Because if at any institutions, if at any point there is some ambiguity about how you should behave, or there are a lot of other institutions within society, let's say you didn't have the family teaching you these things, there is everything else within society telling you how to behave. And so, so uh, uh, what our Marxist thinkers uh, tell us is that actually society is telling us how to behave and controlling the individual so that the individual knows that all of these things are put in place for them to behave a certain way. And if they don't, then there are going to be consequences. So it therefore enforces that you cannot change things. So when it comes to ideological state apparatus, when we look at Althusser, for example, there are so many things put in place to make us think that Oh, this is the way life is supposed to be. We know there's inequalities, but nobody does anything to change the system. Why? 
okay um so base in in essence what we what we're trying to explain here is as a as a marxist uh, thinker would explain that actually society puts all these things with in uh, in position for you not to revolt against the superstructure okay so uh you've got your clues there okay so how is society like a human body uh you're going to write down uh what functionalism talks about when they talk about the body and society um almost being the same thing okay i want you to take out your green pens and be prepared to fill in the missing um knowledge or missing gaps okay and if you haven't absolutely fantastic okay but i want you to tick where you've got your answers right and add in uh, the things that you haven't um put down so pause this video for me now please Every part of the body has a function which will keep it alive and healthy. The human body grows and develops. All the parts of the body link together in one big system. The body fights disease. Using this, I want you to then try to green pen your society first. How do you think they relate? Every part of society helps to keep society going. For example, the family helps uh, by bringing up the next generation. Societies gradually develop and change. All parts of society work together and depend on each other. They are interdependent. And so societies have mechanisms to deal with problems when they occur, such as the police and legal problem. Can you see how similar the body and society is and what functionalism is means when they're talking about the organic analogy okay because the body is an organic being so the organic analogy sees a society as a kind of organism is separate from its individual members the various parts of society are interdependent as they all work together to keep society functioning smoothly. Your task is to draw the, uh, the human body and then I want you to label the following agents of social control. So family, education, the legal system, so the, so the state, media, religion and police. Okay. What I want you to then do for each of those is I want you to write down how you think they maintain social order. So remember, social order is a key word. Okay, how do they maintain social order? Why do we continue being good? Why do we not all revolt? Why? Because there's only a certain amount of police. Okay, we can easily um, over overall, we can easily have anarchy if we all d decided that we didn't in, no longer want to to listen to the police and and laws. Okay, but how do they all put together each individually first and then put together maintain social order? Explain how each maintains social order, which is most important um, or powerful in contemporary society. Okay. So your last one should have a bolt with it, actually, because there is no right or wrong answer for this one. I actually want to know what you think, but I need you to justify your answer. Okay, pause this for me, please. Parsons model of a social system. So your task is to draw, label and explain Parsons' model of a social system. Please go on to Google Classroom, go on to BBC Bite Size, which I, I, I can see has been uh, quite helpful to, to some of you. Um, let that help you and explain to you what your adaption, good attainment, latency and pattern maintenance and integration mean. Why are they all interlinked, okay? Now, I want you to go back onto Google Classroom. You should be on Google Classroom to see this uh, PowerPoint anyway. But I want you to evaluate functionalism. So how can we criticize the functionalist explanation? So you need to read the uh, evaluation of functionalism and create a table of strengths and weaknesses for me. If you can give me some strengths or weaknesses that I haven't given you on your worksheets, then I'm more than happy to give you our points, okay? 
to have a look at the London riots and I want you to to debate it's going to be almost like a silent debate at first um and I want you to tell me was it justified or not now I want you to be both opposition and proposition for this so you're going to give me at least two reasons as to why the London riots was justified and at least two reasons as to why the London uh, riots was not justified okay but I do want you to use your family also because you're going to be reading newspapers and sometimes they're not very clear on which side they stand okay so I don't want you to to, to be too overwhelmed but we will be looking at a lot of current affairs in sociology so I need you to start reading newspapers and different types of new newspapers okay so Speak to your family members and look at the supporting evidence from newspaper articles about the London riots, okay? I want you to prepare an argument for each side of the debate. Pause this video for me, please. And then, when you play it again, make sure you are ready with a green pen, okay? So, the London riots in 2011 shows that the UK is a consensus theory. And everything here are all reasons as to why it is a consensus theory. You might have some things uh, on your um, in your on your research that isn't here, but it's it doesn't mean it's not right. Okay, so still give yourselves a tick. On the other side, the London riots in two thousand and eleven show that the UK is a conflict society. And these are all the reasons as to why. So, for example, black males are seven times more likely to be stopped and searched by the police than white males. Therefore, it increases hostility between black men and the police force. Okay, it makes sense. It's simple. If you were constantly, if you felt as though you were constantly harassed by a certain group of people, you are not going to be happy. And therefore, you are going to eventually have some sort of um, revolt, okay? So if you had a teacher who constantly was picking on you, or if it wasn't just one teacher, it was another teacher and then another teacher, and you were genuinely not doing something wrong, then eventually you're going to either complain the right way, or some will say the wrong way. So you might speak to your parents and get them to talk to Mrs. Jenner, for example, or you might then start behaving like your label because you've been labelled, okay? Labelled as a naughty kid and therefore you start behaving like it. Now, Marxism compared to functionalism. So with your family, your, your neighbours or your friends, I want you to complete the table, so you're going to see a table in a minute, um, making comparisons between the two theories. Comparing the two theories is very important because the you have Marxism on one uh, one side, which is a conflict theory, and functionalism on another on the other side, which is a, a consensus theory. Okay, and you will throughout the next two years compare the two. You're going to use each other, those two, either to strengthen or weaken um, uh, an argument, and it will be your AO3s, for example. Yeah, in your essays. So use the internet, use the handouts on Google Classroom to help you. Use whatever you can, use prior knowledge to help you with this. Ooh. Okay, so not only is this a clue, but you also need to prepare when you finish, prepare your green pen. So remember that functionalism is a consensus theory, whereas Marxism is a conflict theory. Um, therefore, Marxists are going to be a, a, a more critical of the issues on the side. You've got seven issues here, and for each seven of those, I want at least one point for functionalism. So what, how would functionalists um, uh, react to these? And then Marxists, what would Marxists say about these um, issues, for example? Okay. Again, make sure you're labelling your challenge. Your challenge isn't um, something I'm hoping most of you are doing. Your challenge is something within your lesson that you are all you all should be doing. Okay, I've I've, I've done that for you all. Your so functionalists have been accused of viewing the world through rose tinted glasses. So what does that mean? Give an example to strengthen your justification. Okay, this might you might actually be able to ask um, an adult in the uh, in the house, and they might be able to tell you, or you can easily research it. Okay. Trust me, it's not that difficult. Pause this video, get this done for me, please. 
Write green pens out, please. There we go. So for example, if we looked at how does society function, how does society work, you should all at the very least say society operates like the human body, organic analogy for functionalism. That makes sense, we've just done that, okay? Marxism, society is based around class conflict. Again, we've just done that. So these are things that what are bullet points that you should at least have in each box, okay? Um, again, please add in your green pens for me. Pause this video until you are finished. So your research homework is types of feminism. What I want you to do is make sure you create a, 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 a decent fact file. Okay, it could be a study card, it could be a fact file. I don't know if you want to do like a picture or a symbol. So remember iconography. Um, for some of you I've taught in year eight, I've definitely taught you iconography. So uh, just the way for example, just the way you know, every time you see a big arched yellow M, you know that's going to be McDonald's, okay? Um, the tick, we know the tick is always going to be, not just a normal tick, I'm talking about the tick where you want to wear it, it's going to be night, okay? So you can do an icon for each one of those different types of feminism um, on a piece of paper. And so you remember every time, I don't know if you see a star or every time you see, um, you know, different people, for example, different faces, that might be different feminism for you. Radical feminism might be, I'm not too sure we can say for radical feminism, a knife, okay? Because you know, they want to get things done and they want to get it done now kind of thing. So make sure you do that for me. Include key terms because when you are researching these um, feminists, you are going to come across key terms. Um, and I want you to find evidence of gender inequality in contemporary society. So that means right now. Right now, what do we have in society or what can we see in society that's going on which we know isn't fair, okay? But this is about gender, okay? I'm not quite talking about lgbtq plus um not that as of yet okay so we're, we're not talking about um that yet so just hold fire with that 